24 giant single piece granite boxes that are housed in the underground alcoves and tunnels of the ancient Serapium of Saqqara in Egypt are anything but simple objects. Some of them weigh up to 100 tons and almost every aspect of their quarrying, their transport and their construction boggles the mind when you really begin to consider what's involved. The level of planning, effort, skill and technology required to both manufacture the boxes themselves and then to move them to where they have rested from antiquity until today is really hard to overstate. This video is chapter 4 of my Serapium investigation and in it we'll examine some of the best evidence that a form of ancient high technology was clearly used to create these boxes and in particular a technology was used to finish them to a smooth mirror-like surface that still reflects light even after these many thousands of years and this is a technology that seems totally unknown to our own advanced modern civilization of today. My name is Ben and you're watching Uncharted X. If you haven't seen parts 1 through 3 in this series that introduce the site and delve into the box's quarrying and precision aspects, you can find links to those chapters below. And when you're done watching, please remember to hit that like button, consider subscribing to the channel and sharing out the video so that more people can become interested in the mysteries of the Serapium of Saqqara. Let's continue an investigation on the outside of these boxes because there are a couple of aspects of their construction that are worthy of further consideration. The first point I'd make is that these boxes have clearly been made with solidity in mind. The builders don't really care about what they look like, just that they are solid. And this is shown by the scoop marks that are evident across many of these boxes. These scoop marks are the result of hollowing out of cracks in the material. The stone naturally has some cracks, but to prevent the cracks from extending further, what you do is you hollow out that material, you essentially carve out the crack, you remove the material from one side of the crack and the crack goes away, then the box is not susceptible to cracking any further. In many of the boxes, we're going to see something like this, but after it's done, it looks like it's melted down and it's not. Yes. What is happening here? The stone naturally has cracks and what they are doing is emptying the crack so it doesn't extend and cause damage to the rest of the box. Like in this case, you can see the natural crack is right here. You see it? Yes. Hmm? Yeah. So they're working so, around the crack? Hmm? They're working around the floor? They're emptying it out. Yes. Like emptying out so the, the piece can be more solid. Uh -huh. And this is this is a proof that it, when they are doing this, they are doing it for function, not decoration. Right. I'll leave the speculation for the last video, but I assume this is because these boxes were put to some functional use. They were under pressure, or they were vibrating, or they were subject of some force that meant that solidity was very important to them. There are many examples of this hollowing out of cracks, both large and small, across the boxes in the Serapium. What's clear to me is this was done for a specific purpose because having small cracks in a box that is simply a one-time you know, funeral box for a bull wouldn't really matter. But if you are putting the box to some functional use, it matters a great deal. The natural cracks is not needed for the solidness of the box. So they cut them out. So they empty. This one they empty out. I actually think that the really large box that's not quite finished, that's tucked away in the back alcove in the back corner, isn't finished because it had developed a large crack in the side of it. But it has a giant crack in it. You see that? Wow. This crack is still visible today and it's a, it's a huge defect in the stone. And I think that's why it was put into the back corner and was never actually finished. Another notable feature of the exterior of these boxes is the faceting that seems to be happening on both the lids and the boxes themselves. Apart from the areas where the cracks have been hollowed out and you see those scoop marks, all of the faces of the, both the lids and the body seem to be very clearly defined in one plane and there's a sharp angle that defines that plane. Think of a gemstone or a piece of jewellery that is a faceted crystal. Now clearly this hasn't been done for the symmetry of the boxes. In fact, many of these boxes are far from symmetrical. It definitely feels like it is functional to some degree. But we're going to see many things that it doesn't matter the shape, but the function. 
like the facets, they didn't have to have the same symmetry on both sides, but they have to have the facet cut on this one. And faceting is an interesting concept because it definitely has some functionality. Think of the notorious F-117 stealth bomber. It is faceted in order to absorb or redirect energy waves, in that case, radar waves. Here also we don't, we don't find symmetry in the box. This right. side was finished differently than that. But it also looks more functional because it's faceted. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And even in the lower parts like this one, in many cases, you find that it's, it's not broken modernly. No, it is, it is the stone itself, and they facet it. They cut it like when they cut a diamond or something. Hmm? Yeah. And given that granite and this type of igneous rock is highly crystalline in nature, you have to wonder whether or not this faceting has been done for a specific purpose. Because the faceting of these types of materials is a consequence of the crystal structure itself and the surface energy that's present in the box both in practical application, as per things like the stealth bomber, and in theory, there appears to be a relationship between faceting of crystalline structures and the thermodynamic free energy of the crystal itself, as well as surface energy. Let me quote directly from Wikipedia, because I am by no means an expert in this. Quote, The brevase lattice of the crystal structure defines a set of possible low energy planes, which are usually planes on which the atoms are close packed. For instance, a cubic crystal may have low energy planes on the faces of the cube or on the diagonals. The planes are low energy in the sense that if the crystal is cleaved along these planes, there will be relatively few broken bonds and a relatively small increase in energy over the unbroken crystal. Equivalently, those planes have a low surface energy. The planes with the lowest energy will form the largest facets in order to minimize the overall thermodynamic free energy of the crystal. If the surface energy as a function of the planes is known, the equilibrium shape of the crystal may be found via the Wolf construction." End quote. Now while that is all certainly a bunch of scientific information and I don't pretend to understand it any better than most people probably do, my point is to illustrate that there does happen to be some sort of functional and certainly theoretical relationship between energy and the faceting of the boxes. I can't imagine the, yeah. how they did this. I mean, this is here, just, here, for example, the angle is not sharp, but they still faceted it. Now, I should emphasize that this is purely speculation on my part. There is no real scientific testing ever been done to back this type of thing up. But if you were to assume that that faceting was a functional aspect of the box, then perhaps it was done for solidity because with a facet, you have the least broken atomic bonds between the crystalline structures. So it would be the most solid form of crystal. Or perhaps it was something like the F117 where you were using those facets to either reflect or perhaps even focus some form of energy that's either coming into or going out from the box. If we are able to acknowledge that the answers to some of these questions lay outside of our perspective that perhaps lay in domains of knowledge that we haven't yet discovered or figured out or domains of knowledge that we've forgotten, then it opens up a lot of avenues towards very interesting research and opportunities for learning. I mean, I can think of things like piezoelectricity or telluric currents or the electromagnetic induction capabilities of different types of stone. I've done some testing myself with Yusuf Aowan. Uh, Luke and I did that on one of our Pukajay videos, and we tested the EMI capabilities of different types of megalithic stone, and the results were quite interesting. But the bottom line is, I think these are all avenues that we should be exploring rather than just dismissing out of hand. I did a whole podcast on perspective if you want to check it out. By now, we've looked at many different aspects and characteristics of these giant stone boxes. We have one more to go, and I've kind of saved the best for last here, because this is, to me, the most interesting aspect of the boxes and the one that presents the most proof that there must have been something of a high technology nature going on when they were constructed. And that proof is in the finishing or the polishing. In all of the footage that you've seen down at the Serapium, you'll see that many of the boxes, most of them in fact, are polished to a degree that makes them shine like a mirror. They reflect light, even through the thick coating of dust that is over everything in the Serapium, they still shine like a mirror. This really isn't a natural property of granite. When you look in the Serapium, there are really three stages of machining and finishing that are evident. There is the rough stone machining and the shaping phase then there is a flattening stage where it gets to an almost shiny surface, but it's not quite shiny. And there are some parts of the boxes that are left in this state, parts of the boxes like the undersides of the lids. Here also we have other machining, probably the latest layer. We saw how the rough machining reached a certain point. 
We have more machining here. Look at it here. Fine lines. If you can bring it with your camera. You see, there are fine lines. Yeah. You see it? Yes. That looks like the final process or the final stage of smoothing before they give it the shining polish. So the shining, uh, and you see it here too. It's like a vitrification almost, right? Is it okay. the... But most of the other surfaces of the box get to what is a flawless mirror finish. And while there aren't any tool marks to show that this was done with any tools or by hand, there are some residual marks that indicate this was done by some form of liquid. The evidence for a liquid being used to polish the granite is best shown on the box that has all of the glyphs scratched into it. The lid is slightly askew, so we can see both the sides and the underneath of the lid. And as I mentioned earlier, the sides and the top of the lid are finished to a fine mirror polish. But the underside of the lid is not. And it's not just a visual difference. When you run your finger across both the side and the underside of the lid, the difference is obvious. One is smooth as glass, the other one is slightly rough. Yet if you take a close look at the edge where these two surfaces meet, you will find what looks like pooling and drip marks on the underneath of the lid. As if a viscous liquid has run down the sides of the box, collected in places, and then dripped off. Where you can see these marks, the surface is smooth, it's polished, and it's just like the rest of the box, yet not like the remainder of the underside of the box. Look, here, this side, this is where we discovered this. And I have the eye, you see. So, this is the smooth, the smooth surface of granite, but not shiny. Hmm? This is shiny, this is not shiny. But between them, here. This is where we found the truth. A liquid, some kind of liquid. So the liquid leaks down here and then forms these lines with drops. And that's how, same like how you read that somebody <laughs> was walking on top of it, right. because obviously no doubt about that. And these, where that liquid ran, exactly the same um, shiny surface like that and it gave it all the explanations we need and it also explained how the polishing reached all these deeper levels. How has this happened if the box's finish was achieved by hand? Why would you go to the trouble of smoothing and polishing such marks on the underside of the lid? Or does it make more sense to interpret what we're seeing as exactly what it is? Evidence that a liquid was indeed used to polish these boxes. And it's not just on these boxes that you can see this type of liquid alchemical evidence. It also shows up in the Red Pyramid at the Pyramids of Giza and on many of the objects in the museum. And these are all topics that I plan to investigate further in future videos. So just to be clear, we don't polish stone in this way in our granite industry and in our stoneworks. We use mechanical devices. Now let's consider how we claim the ancient Egyptians polished the stone. The theory goes that there was sand and water and stone used to rub the rock. You rub it enough with sand and water and other stones and apparently it ends up in this perfect mirror finish. The big mystery here that is pretty obvious to anyone that, that takes a look at the boxes is how do you polish the scoops? How do you polish the indentations? But for us, we looked at this in the beginning before we, we see the evidence of the formula. And uh, we... As a stone carver, I said like this cannot be the normal style of polishing that they, they think it was done. Still well, alive. first of all, we looked at these deeper parts, and as a stone carver, I was like saying like, this is impossible. Why? Because I saw that inside these lower parts, the polishing still in these deeper ones as good as the one on the surface. And if you follow that manual style, of course, you will never be able to go to these pits in the, in the stone. You will never reach with your sandpaper or with your piece of rock or with whatever you have. You will never reach that level of polishing as same as the flat surface on the outside. So we, we had many uh, like ideas looking around it and thinking like uh, maybe this is a kind of uh, bacteria that affected the stone and things like that. Until one day, and uh, there is no coincidence, but when it was the time for us to see and realize, hmm? like these ones especially, yeah. yeah. You see these ones? It's, it's, it's like a circle, semi-circle. Semi yeah, and it's polished in the inside, same like 
anything else inside the deck room. Yeah. yeah. And I know under, a huge one on the side. Under yeah. underneath the lid of this last box, you can see the drifts right from what may have been some form of alchemy. Or this is it, it is it is. So where is the theory now of polishing with the sand under the water under the rock? It's only on the scene on the wall, but not on the real artifact. Which one I'm gonna believe? Of course, the real artifact is the one that tells you the absolute truth. Suggesting that this was done in antiquity by hand by somebody just using rocks and sand and water and rubbing on it for long enough is frankly inconceivable. I'd love to see it demonstrated, but I don't think you'll find anybody that has done so successfully. Polishing the indentations is an extremely difficult ask. We don't polish indentations like this. We tend to make flat surfaces of granite and polish those. That's how our machinery is set up to work. So let's take a quick look at how we process granite and in particular how we polish granite and apply that finish to it, the finish that you typically see on kitchen counters and other granite objects. We use giant polishing machines that use again abrasives, uh, pads and abrasive materials to actually polish and finish the granite to this point. And it's always done on a flat surface as well. Here's another granite processing site, again giant polishing machines that are all polishing just flat surfaces. We're not really set up to polish divots or to do anything like that. One last characteristic of the finishing that's worth mentioning, and that is the durability of the finish. Consider that these objects are immeasurably ancient, and they've rested here for at least many thousands of years. They've been covered in dust and sand and rubble, and their polish it endures to this day. And this is the case for many of the oldest objects that I think were inherited by the ancient Egyptians. Objects like this box at Abu Sir. It was once housed underground, in fact you have to go down a small pyramid-like shaft in order to get to this space, but it's been open to the sky and the weather now for centuries, if not millennia. Yet with a little water to clean the surface, it's amazing polish, it still shines through today. It's almost as if the finishing process used by the original builders sealed the stone surface permanently. And indeed in places where the finish has been damaged or say the edge has been chipped away, a careful examination seems to indicate that there's a depth to the finish as if the liquid has penetrated the rock by a millimeter or thereabouts. Oh, that's and good, that's that last one we're going to see. After we saw it here, we realized it in many other boxes. And also we realized that it's not acid. It's a layer. Yeah. It's a layer above the granite, not an acid that, that like, uh, like polished it to that level. We simply don't have this capability when working with stone. Indeed, we as a civilization don't seem to be able to really replicate this type of a finish. The best example I can give you is a story that Yusuf first told me about, and it's, it's a story about the modern Egyptian statue called the Nahadet Masa, or Egypt Awakens. It was first made in the 1920s, and it was unveiled in 1928, and it stands at Giza still today. It's made from granite, it's made out of multiple pieces that were bolted together. The whole statue had to be shipped to Italy in order to be polished. Egypt didn't have the capability to polish granite, I'll, I'll, I'll let that sink in for a minute. Today, only a scant 90 years later since this statue was put in place, the polish that is, was on that statue has really faded into dullness. Compare that, compare that result to the objects that we witness in the Serapium, which were apparently made by a primitive people, made by hand, finished in place, in tight underground caverns, and finished at some point deep in antiquity. Surely this alone should justify the call for an open-minded investigation of this mystery. Hey everyone, this is Ben. Uh, that's the end of this video. I hope you all enjoyed it. We're nearly done in the Serapium series. That's the end of the investigation into the boxes. I do have one more video to take a look at the site and some of the contradictions in the writing and some of the evidence for renovation, things like that. And to wrap it all up, I will produce one long video that puts all of these pieces together into a full length thing. So I've passed a thousand subscribers recently. I'd like to thank everybody for helping me to get there, everyone that subscribed to the channel and in particular everyone that has helped to support me uh, through any of the mechanisms that are outlined at unchartedx.com support. And of course, if you did enjoy this video, I'd really love it if you would consider returning some of that value to me. I'm trying to follow a value for value model so that if you get something out of these videos, if you get some value, please look at returning some of that to me via one of the mechanisms that are 
on my site over at unchartedx.com slash support. I'm on Patreon. I'm on Subscribestar. I have what is effectively a tip jar on PayPal that some people use after I produce videos, and I really do appreciate that. I also have uh, Bitcoin now. If internet currencies are what floats your boat, consider it like tipping a server. The, the cost of a cup of coffee, $3, $5, or maybe a movie ticket if you got that much uh, entertainment out of it. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it really helps me to make these videos. And thanks everyone for the support, and I'll see you all again soon. Peace.